time now, nine o'clock. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you the autobiography of Will Rogers, edited by Donald Day, starring Edward Arnold with Will Rogers, Jr. on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, I shall share with you the pleasure of hearing again some of the wisest and wittiest words that have been spoken in our lifetime. A great American spoke them. His name was Will Rogers, and here with us tonight is his son, Will Rogers. Will, your father's remarks are a part of American literature, and I can't tell you how honored we all feel to have you here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. You know, my father always said that he hoped no man would write his biography. But in looking over his material, we discovered he'd actually written his own. And I'm glad you're going to tell it here tonight on the Hallmark Playhouse. So are we, Will. And to help us tell it, we are fortunate to have with us one of Hollywood's most distinguished actors and one who knew Will Rogers very well indeed, Edward Arnold. And now a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of The Autobiography of Will Rogers. Hallmark is the name to remember when you want to remember your friends. For birthdays, weddings, anniversaries, holidays, there is a quality about Hallmark cards that whispers good taste. And you'll send them with pride, for that identifying Hallmark on the back adds meaning. It says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting the autobiography of Will Rogers, starring Edward Arnold. Listen to the legend of a man who loved to laugh. My ancestors didn't exactly come over in the Mayflower, but they met the boat. You are about to hear some words that America once loved. They were spoken by a long, lanky cowboy who ambled out of the West one day. Not so good looking as some, better looking than others. Pretty average looking on the whole. He rode out of the West twirling a rope with a wad of gum in his jaw and a grin on his face. He was laughing the first time anyone got a good look at him. And he was laughing the last time anyone saw him. He laughed at everything and everybody. And he taught America to laugh at herself. The national budget is a mythical bean bag. Uh, Congress votes mythical beans into it and, and then tries to reach in and pull real beans out. Uh, a, a Democrat would rather make a speech than make a dollar. Uh, politics is the best show in America, but I always remember this, that uh, as bad as we sometimes think our government is run, it's the best run I ever saw. Will was born on the last frontier as it was passing out of existence. At his very doorstep, a miracle was taking form and semblance. Out of sweat and steel and horseflesh and men's dreams and men's angers, a continent was being conquered and a nation built. In no time at all, as time is reckoned in the lives of nations. He watched it grow and grew with it. In his veins, the blood of the white man mingled with the blood of the Cherokee. In his heart, the dreams and loves of the white man mingled with the dreams and the loves of the Cherokee. 
His was an eager spirit, mentally and physically on the move, and yet his feet were always planted firmly in the soil from which he came. He was born on a ranch in the heart of Oklahoma's Indian Territory. He had this to say about it. There's nothing of which I'm more proud than my Cherokee blood. Almost as soon as Will could hold a rope, he was learning to do tricks with it. During the hot, lazy Oklahoma afternoons when he was supposed to be in the schoolroom, he was out in some shady spot lassoing every human and animal that was luckless enough to pass by. In desperation, his father finally decided to send him to military school in Missouri. Will arrived there in 1897, dressed in a 10-gallon hat, with the tops of his trousers tucked in his high-heeled red-top boots. His luggage consisted mainly of carefully coiled ropes. He was in trouble almost as soon as he got there. My dear Mr. Rogers, I very much regret that I am forced to write to you that you will have to make immediate plans to remove your son, William Rogers, to another school. We have tried very hard to make a military man of him, but we have been unable to convince him that a soldier carries a gun and not a lariat. Last night, he lassoed our statue of Diana, the goddess of the hunt, off the top of the water fountain and demolished it completely. A bill is enclosed. This morning, he lassoed his history instructor. The instructor was not seriously injured, so we are not enclosing a bill. However, please contact the school immediately with regard to what arrangements you wish to make. Here, Roger. Come, Bobby. Help someone. Help! I've been lassoed! <laughs> Well, it wasn't long after this that Will and school education gave each other up by mutual agreement. Then Will got some traveling in under his belt. He spent time in Argentina as a cowboy. He joined a circus in South Africa and became known as the Cherokee Kid. He took in New Zealand and Australia. And at a racing meet in Australia, he tried out a trick that met with great favor. While his horse was streaking across the field, he leaned back over the horse's rump and picked up three handkerchiefs from the ground. Will never forgot the way the applause sounded that day in Australia. A few moments after he performed the stunt, a man came up to him. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Uh, that's me. I'm from the Governor General's party, Mr. Rogers. The Governor General admired that last trick you did. He requested me to pay you his compliments and ask you if you would be kind enough to do the trick again. Yeah, no. Well, well. You will favor the Governor General, of course. Sure, I'll favor him for $150. Well, one hundred and fifty dollars? You want one hundred and fifty dollars? Uh, do you think the Governor General will think one hundred and fifty dollars is too much? Yes, I most certainly do think the Governor General will think one hundred and fifty dollars is too much. All right. You tell the Governor General if he'll do it cheaper, I'll loan him my horse and handkerchief. <laughs> Chance had taken Will Rogers into the show business. And when he arrived home from abroad, he started touring America with the so-called Wild West shows. On November 25th, 1908, he married Betty Blake of Rogers, Arkansas. This is what Will had to say about that. When I wrote her, that was the star performance of my life. <laughs> In 1915, Will Rogers went to work for Florence Zigfield. Every night he would come out twirling his rope and start talking. He would stand up there on that stage, grinning across the footlights at America. And America would sit in the orchestra and the balcony and the boxes and grin right back at him. It was love at first sight. He was as real as a mule wiggling its ears on a hot summer day. Will was the first performer in theatrical history to base his humor on the fair, the affairs of the day. He always said he couldn't run out of jokes, that all he had to do to get laughs was to watch Congress and report the facts. I, I, I read in the papers that uh, we have two holidays of equal importance in the same week, uh, Halloween and the congressional elections. Uh, and of the two, uh, uh, election provides us the most fun. Uh, on Halloween, they put uh, pumpkins on their heads, and uh, on election, they don't have to. It was also in 1915 that Will played for President Wilson. 
He was the least known member of the entire cast, and his act consisted of kidding some of the president's policies. There was no way of knowing how the president would react to that, and Will was frank to admit that he was scared to death to go on. Yes? Five minutes, Mr. Rogers. Five minutes? Is that all? Yep. You die in five more minutes for kidding your country. Uh, uh, how, how's the show going? Great. So far. The theater's full of plain clothesmen, though. You better watch what you say. Wouldn't want any of them to take a shot at you. Oh, uh, they wouldn't shoot an actor on the stage, would they? <laughs> well, you never can tell. No, I suppose not. You know what I wish? I wish I was back in Claremore, Oklahoma. Yeah? Well, you may be. Will walked into the wings. In his state of nerves, he imagined that the other performers watched him pass with great pity. He walked out on the stage like a man taking the last steps of the last mile. I'm kind of nervous here tonight. <laughs> I am... Um... I, I, I see where they've captured uh, Pancho Villa in Mexico. Yeah, uh, they, they, they got him in the morning editions, and uh, the afternoon ones let him get away. Uh, we, we, we chased him over the line five miles, but uh, ran into a lot of uh, government red tape and uh, had to come back. There was a pause. The man on the stage and the entire audience looked anxiously up at the presidential box. And then from the box came a comforting, wonderful, reassuring sound. <laughs> the President of the United States was laughing. And then the entire audience and the man on the stage burst into gales of laughter. But the man on the stage heard only the laughter of the man in the box. And the laughter of that man in the box reached across the theater to the man on the stage like a hand clasp. The same sly humor that had been his pass key to the heart of America had been Will Rogers' passkey to the heart of America's president. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of the autobiography of Will Rogers, starring Edward Arnold. Has this ever occurred to you about the greeting cards you buy? They are more than material articles, more than fine paper and expert craftsmanship, color and design. Even more important, they carry thoughts and feelings from one person to another. You buy greeting cards only to send to others, never for yourself. That is why you want the finest. And I think you'll find there's agreement about which cards are the finest if you'll ask this question. Just ask any group of friends what name they think of in greeting cards when they want to send the very best. See if they don't answer immediately, as my friends did, Hallmark cards. That's because they have learned from experience that Hallmark cards have a magic way of using words to reach the hearts of others. Words carefully chosen to carry an extra measure of warmth and friendliness and sincerity. They found there is always a Hallmark card to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And so it is easy to remember it would be difficult to forget to look for that hallmark on the back of every card you choose when you care enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. You know, Will, some of those remarks of your father's are amazingly timely today. Yes, I've often thought of that, Jimmy. Do you know that back in 1933 he said, you can't say civilization don't advance, for in every war they kill you in a new way. <laughs> he also said... It's great to be friendly with a foreign nation, but it's terribly expensive. My father liked to kid everyone everywhere. Yes, and we shall hear more about that in the second act of the story of Will Rogers, starring Edward Arnold. Listen to the legend of a man who loved to laugh. Half our life is spent trying to find something to do with the time we have rushed through life trying to save. Yes, you are listening to words that America once loved. They were spoken on the stage, printed in the newspapers, heard and quoted on the radio. 
As the years passed, Will Rogers became the number one entertainer, newspaper columnist, after dinner speaker, and lecturer in the United States. And what was even more important, he became also, without a doubt, first of all of these, in the hearts of his countrymen. He made his first movie, Laughing Bill Hyde, in 1918. And in 1919, he received his first fan letter. A movie fan sent him 25 cents in stamps to pay for a photograph. Will was astounded. My dear sir, I, I thank you for the use of your money. I, I haven't got a picture of myself. If I did have it, it wouldn't be worth two bits. In fact, if I had one, I'd give you two bits to keep it. Yours, Will Rogers. Remember 1924? Republicanism rode high. The Saturday Evening Post printed the gospel. General Pershing was retired on half pay. Walter Johnson zoomed his first ball over. A lot of the newspapers were screaming heatedly, keep cool with Coolidge. Stocks were rising like toy balloons. Woodrow Wilson died. What he stood for and died for will be strived after for years. The world has lost a friend. The theater has lost its greatest supporter. And I have lost the most distinguished person who ever laughed at my little nonsensical jokes. I look forward to it every year. Now I have only to look back on it as my greatest memory. It's great to be great, but it's greater to be human. Curtains went up, went down. Newspapers went to press, and on the first pages of many of the leading papers appeared a box with Will Rogers' comments on the day's headlines. Time and Tide brought their daily changes and his comments on those changes. The market crash. Some of the rich became poor, and some of the poor became rich. Presidents and congresses came and went, and Will watched what was going on. Nudged America in the ribs and said, Hey, uh, did you ever stop to think about this? Uh, the Lord put millions of people all over the earth. They don't all agree on how they got there, and 90% don't care. But he was pretty wise when he did see to it that they all do agree on one thing. And that is, the better lives you live, the better you finish. The, uh, the nation never looked like it was facing a worse winter. Uh, birds, geese, Democrats, and all perishable animals are already huddling up in three or four states down south. Uh, we're at peace with the world because the world is waiting to get another gun and get it loaded. Today, I, I read a speech uh, that, where, what, that Franklin Roosevelt made uh, that just about threw him in the ring as the next Democratic candidate. The, the Democratic Party has some of the finest men as candidates that we have in this country. And it's a shame that they are to be eternally handicapped by being right but never present. To President-elect Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Warren Springs, Georgia. Congratulations on your election. Don't worry too much. A smile in the White House again will look like a meal to us. Will Rogers loved the earth. He loved to lope across it on horseback with the wind in his face and the rhythm of his pony's feet in tune with the rhythm of his heart. 
He loved the musical leathery sighs of a good saddle and the thin cry of a rope whistling through the air. He loved campfires, sitting around them in silent communication with good friends, watching the flames leap higher and higher into the dark and then finally burn themselves down to embers. He loved the tall trees that looked down on man and up to God. He loved desert soil, a naked river, an untamed mountain, as the Cherokee had loved them, for they were his blood and bone and sinew. And he loved the cities, the melodious jangle of horns and streetcars and sirens, the shining accomplishment of bridge and building and skyscraper and theater decked in neon. He loved the cities with the deep native pride of the white man. Yes, Will Rogers loved the earth. And next to the earth, he loved the sky. Yes, Will Rogers loved the sky. His ancestors had set, set out for frontiers on horseback and covered wagons. But the only frontier left for him was the sky. On March 10th of 1935, he wrote, I've never been up to that Alaska. Wiley Post went up there this last summer and went hunting in the plain, but I never did get further north than a block north of Main Street in Seattle. That was it. It was written there in the papers for everyone to see. Will was beginning to hunger after horizons again. Every time a plane went over, he was out in his backyard staring at the sky. Wonder where that plane's going, Betty? Well, I think you'd better get on one, Will. You are getting sort of nervous again. I'd like to take a vacation in Alaska. Taking off this hour of night. It's almost midnight. Will Rogers, Wiley Post. August 6th. Uh, a week so back, I took off on a little sightseeing trip with Wiley Post. Uh, this Alaska is a beautiful country. You know Alaska, August 7th. Well, it was some trip. A, a thousand mile hop from Seattle to Juneau. Uh, uh, this new farm colony here in Alaska is having a little trouble. It, it's a great deal easier a pioneering for gold than pioneering for spinach. You know Alaska, uh, August 9th. Bad weather. And so, a man lived and laughed and had a bit of fun at everyone's expense, and mostly at his own, and suddenly and swiftly stopped laughing, shocking the air with sudden silence. So it was that the last joke was told, the last words filed away, the chapter completed. Some who had never known him, but counted him their friend, wept for him. Others stood in quiet disbelief, staring at the sky, Will Rogers dead? Why, Will couldn't die. His words had come like a folk song fresh from the hearts of the people. His longings were their own longings made articulate. His people were the granite fibers out of which democracy had been built. And when he spoke, he had spoken for them. Will Rogers dead in an airplane crash in Alaska? <laughs> Oh, nonsense. He couldn't be. Will Rogers is riding his pony out in the desert. He come riding in one of these days, still twinkling under that Stetson, still laughing. And who 
was he? What did he do? What did he say? What was he that people loved him so? I met a lot of people, but I never met a man I didn't like. That's it. That's the whole thing. That's Will Rogers' whole lifetime in one sentence. He threw out those words like a lasso, and he caught America by the heart. He is legend. He is ageless. He is immortal. A legend never dies as long as the people will it to live on. I met a lot of people, but I never met a man I didn't like. Now, Mr. Hilton has some news for us. I have an announcement tonight that gives me a great deal of pleasure, and I'm sure it will give equal pleasure to all friends of the Hallmark Playhouse. My news is that arrangements have been completed in London with Mr. Winston Churchill for the use of his paintings on Hallmark cards. We know Mr. Churchill is a great statesman, the wartime leader of Britain, a figure who will stand out in the history of the world. More recently, we have known Mr. Churchill as perhaps the world's most famous amateur painter. His paintings are the kind I'm sure you'll enjoy seeing on your Hallmark cards. Though an amateur painter, several of his works, submitted under an assumed name, have been exhibited by the Royal Academy of London. So it's a rare honor and a great privilege for the makers of Hallmark cards to bring you the paintings of Mr. Winston Churchill, where they can be so widely seen and appreciated. Mr. Hilton, that's wonderful news. Speaking for myself, I'm very anxious to see Mr. Churchill's paintings on Hallmark cards. It must make all of you with Hallmark very proud. Indeed it does, Edward Arnold, and thank you for your splendid telling of the story of a truly great American. Thank you, too, Will Rogers, for joining us tonight. It was a genuine pleasure for me, Mr. Hilton, and I'd like to thank Mr. Ted DeCorsia for his excellent portrayal of my father, and to you, Mr. Edward Arnold, for telling the story so beautifully. Well, it was a privilege, I assure you, Will. You know, I knew your father and was one of his great admirers. One of his wonderful gifts was his ability to make his fellow Americans interested in the issues of the day. As we said in our story tonight, he watched what was going on and nudged America in the ribs. And while he was doing it, he made us all want to be better citizens. And today, perhaps more than ever, we should know and respect our American heritage. Because today, more than ever, freedom is everybody's job. Uh, tell me, Mr. Hilton, what have you selected for next week? Next week, we shall have a story by Jack Rubin bearing the intriguing title, The Indestructible Julia a story of an attractive woman who combines the care of her younger sisters and brother with the achievement of her heart's desire. We're looking forward to having with us that fine Academy Award-winning actress, Katina Paxino. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, and our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Edward Arnold may currently be seen in the Paramount picture Dear Wife with William Holden and Joan Caulfield. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Patina Paxinu in The Indestructible Julia and the week following Alfred Leland Crabbe's Home to the Hermitage starring Burgess Meredith and the week after that Richard Todd in Charles O'Neill's Three Wishes of Jamie McRuin on the Hallmark Playhouse. <laughs> this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri. Stay tuned for our...